I think that means we're going live. We're live! Okay, now I just got to make sure this thing's working. It's working good. Because this is a brand new message for me. This is a message I've never given before like this, but um, I gave it the last five days by text, or by, by, by my posts. But before I do that, I've got a whole bunch of things to do, first of all. Um, I was getting a little bit grumpy that Don hadn't texted me. I mean, you, you said, oh, it's so lovely when Don... He hasn't texted me about it. And I'm sitting there, and what happens? He texts me. <laughs> that big hot dog. Okay, uh, let me see. A couple of things. Y'all have one of these cards. And if you don't, I have a bunch more in the back, so please go get them. There are... I do a lot of writing, okay? And there are free short stories that you can download. Either go to the QR code or go to that website or get a young person to help you do that, okay? <laughs> no, no, that's what I have to do. When I have something wrong with my computer or something, I'd say, yo, one of you guys in the back, I need your help. You, you know, that, that's what happens, okay. And um, so these are free short stories that I'm doing, that I've written teaching prayer through the fun of a short story. And um, so that's there. And my website information is on the back. This is different, though. You don't have any of these. In the back, I've got a bunch of these cards that have a verse on it, or actually the verse is on the back, and then praying the verse, in other words, I've rewritten the verse as a prayer, and it's, it's on the front, okay? And then I have some blank ones. The blank ones are for you to take as many as you want, and I've got more in a box. Because I want you to take them blank, and go home, find a verse that you like, and write it down. So you're looking at it every day to pray it. Back to the Lord. Okay, that takes care of that. Um, let me see this. Okay, I told you I do a lot of writing. For you fathers or grandfathers that want to get a gift for your kids or grandkids, here is a book that I wrote. It's actually from 1887. And it's got a little graphic from 1887 and then a little prayer based upon the verse. So the children are associating prayer with the Word of God. Moms, ladies, kids, if you forgot to get your dad a Christmas, uh, a Father's Day gift, I've got one back there and a couple others. And this is my novel. Oh, by the way, everything back there, five bucks except my novel is 15. I love teaching on prayer, so I wanted to do something different. And so, and I'm doing this now because I don't want to do it later on. But I'm teaching prayer through the fun of fiction. So if you like Christian fiction, it's three different eras and they're, they're just... They're just, they're just a whole bunch of people that are modeling prayer for us. Okay, enough of that sales stuff. Oh, she left. This is for your little girl. The visitor, right? There you go. And you just had surgery, right? Yeah. Okay, now you're not you're not gonna like this. This is gonna kick your tail, okay? <laughs> Which is a good Father's Day gift to get, you know. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. I understand that. We're outnumbered by the ladies. That's why I handle that one. Okay? Me and no donkey. Um, right. Your choice of music was fabulous for where I'm going today. Um, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? Go ahead and put that up there. Um... This is Father's Day, okay? So this is going to be a Father's Day message. Um, but it's going to be a little different than what you're expecting. Let me open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, as I come before these folks this morning, I cannot do this on my own. In, in fact, Lord, I, I can't do this, period. I've talked to you about refilling we with your Holy Spirit, and I trust you to have done that. I thank you for this wonderful music that I was able to just spend time with. And Lord, we look forward to this message today. I look forward to sharing this message because I believe it's relevant, incredibly relevant. And so, Lord, we look forward to what you do today through men and women's and boys and girls' hearts. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, we recognize that the Lord is our Father, right? And we see that clearly in a whole bunch of places. One of them in particular is when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. 
in Luke chapter 11, um, it says, He was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John has taught his disciples. And he said, all right, I will. Whenever you pray, pray, Father, your name be honored as holy. It's a little different version than what you're used to. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us. And do not bring us into temptation. Now, I collect old Christian books, okay? I love collecting old Christian books. I've got so many books on prayer, it's, it's not even funny. Many of them from the 1800s, a couple from the 1700s. And I have this one book that has 700 pages that teach about the Lord's Prayer. It's incredible. But I can tell you what the Lord's Prayer is all about in two words. See where it says, Father, your name be honored as holy. That is us awing God. A-W-E. Awing God. Reverencing God. And then when it goes on, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us. That's all about trusting God. That's all the Lord's Prayer is all about. Awing God and trusting God. The passage goes on, verse 5, it says, He said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. So what, God is, what Jesus is doing is he's continuing this process of showing us what the Father is like. That's what I want you to hear, okay? He's showing us what the Father is like. And he's showing us what the Father is like by showing us the opposite of the Father. So there's a friend, he, he says, a, 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 a friend and goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves. And you know the story. The guy's not going to get up because he's, he's in bed. He doesn't want to get up. But at the end of the passage, he says, he will get up. And listen to this. He will give him as much as he needs. Uh, not just three loaves. He's going to give him whatever he needs. Of course, the passage goes on from there. The very, very famous passage where it says, So ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. But I'm afraid that in that we miss these, this little tiny four-letter word, will. He says, keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on searching and you will find it. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Not maybe. Not possibly. It says that it will be opened unto you. You will find it. It's incredibly important to understand, especially in light of the Mount Zion bus crash. You got this Mount Zion bus crash that has just occurred. And I gotta be honest with you, I, I, this stuff happens all the time and I'm never compelled to write on it, okay? But I couldn't stop myself this time. I even had a friend of mine, I, I noted this in one of the posts, he said, Mark, the way you wrote this, you need to take them down. I had another guy say, well, you know, that's okay, but you really need to word it this way. Unfortunately, what I wrote over five days, and you can, you can go to my website and see them. What I wrote over the five days gets everybody a little grumpy about something. And that, that wasn't my intent, okay? And if you begin to go through them and you can't handle them, jump to the fifth one, because the fifth one is kind of a feel-good one. Although, again, I didn't mean it that way, it's just kind of the way it came out. So we've just looked at the fact that the Bible says, seek and you will find. Ask and knock and what? It will, not maybe, not possibly. So i got to put that in light of this bus crash and ask some serious questions and ask you to ask some serious questions of yourself and the way you view prayer. See, here's what I think happens. I think often when a difficulty comes our way or when something like this happens, forgive me, we salve over our heart and don't really deal with some of the deep issues that we need to. Y'all, we are going to today. And just, if you think things are going to be nice and easy next week, let me just tell you next week's sermon title, and then you can decide today if you don't want to come or not. Praying for revival 
Is it a waste of time? Now, I don't think it is, but but you probably won't like where I go. And again, not purposely. It just I love everybody to love me, okay? But this message today and next week is is it's one of those things I just keep trying to get away get away from, you know. No, 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 Lord. Something else. Bring something else to my mind. No. So anyway, you'll, you'll love next week or not. One of the two. So let's begin to look at some of these logical questions that are raised as a result of the Mount Zion bus crash. Okay. Surely these people have got to have prayed. You know they were praying for protection. Somebody probably got on the bus in Alabama and said, yo, let's pray. And they talked to God and they all you know, started to talk to God. And even on the bus, somebody prayed for protection. And they've got prayer teams. Surely they were praying for protection all the way around, right? Now y'all realize the reason why I'm bringing this up is not to throw stones at anybody else. Not at all. The reason I'm bringing this up is because you and I pray for protection. So bear with me here as we wander through some of these things. Do you think maybe the wrong person prayed? Do you think maybe the person that prayed had unconfessed sin in their life? Did God not hear the prayers? It doesn't make any sense. All of these people are praying for protection and this crazy thing happens. This tragedy happens. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me about how I should pray. Should I continue to pray for protection for myself? For my loved ones? Maybe, maybe, next week when I, when I, when I leave here, I'm, I'm heading north towards Cincinnati. Maybe when I get to Cincinnati, I ought to say, I made it. Maybe all the way up there, I should be just counting my lucky stars that I'm still safe and haven't gotten into a wreck yet. I'm not trying to be flippant, okay? I'm just trying to bring out the obvious questions that y'all may or may not be thinking. And if you're not thinking these things, you're over it. Praise the Lord. Good for you. I'll be done in a little bit. As much as I talk like this, we all recognize that what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's, it's difficult to say. It just doesn't feel right. Especially in light of, say, um, Matthew 6.34, which says, do not worry about tomorrow. Or, or, or how about um, Proverbs 3.5, the first half of the verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. How do I reconcile those verses with the questions that I'm bringing up? Because they're real questions. Have you decided that this kind of an accident proves to you that it doesn't make any sense at all to pray? If you have decided that, I completely understand. Now, I'm a prayer guy, okay? I know that sounds kind of weird coming from my lips. But if you look openly and honestly at this and you decide, you know what, prayer just doesn't make any sense, I get that. I understand that. Join me throughout this next half an hour as we look at four things. One, why did this happen? Two, when can this be pre- present, uh, prevented? Three, what should I now pray? And four, how can I trust God again? Some would argue that bad things happen when there's unconfessed sin in people's lives. And that God brings things into people's lives because they need to be taught a lesson. Some would also say, when they look at something like this, is, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How is this going to impact my prayer life? Is prayer just blind luck? We don't want to think it is. But again, this is just some of the logical stuff we've got to ask ourselves. 
And then, of course, there's the idea that how can I really trust God again? If I'm looking sincerely and honestly at this, how can I really trust God again? Again, I don't mean to be flippant in any way. The truth is that some of you are going to deal with this with all kinds of emotions. But I want to remind you of something. God's shoulders are big enough for you to come to him and say, Lord, I don't think prayer is merely blind luck, but I really have no clue how to look at this thing rightly from now on. And I want your help. I need your help. Even as you say that, though, Why would God listen to your prayer if he didn't listen to all those other prayers? I'm not trying to be mean, okay? Y'all know me that have heard me before. I'm all about prayer. But why should he listen to you? Why should he listen to me? In light of him not listening to all those other people, if that's what happened. So, let's jump into the first one. Why did this happen? If you want to go to sleep for the next 10 minutes, let me give you the answer. I have no idea. Okay? But asking the question, why did this happen, brings up a few other questions for us. Let me me ask this. Does God bring bad things into our lives, or does he merely allow bad things into our lives? This is participatory. Allow. I'm hearing allow. I'm not hearing bring. I'm not hearing that he doesn't bring bad things into our life. Is that right? Okay. Um, I love to always bring that question up because I don't believe that God merely brings bad things into our lives. I'm sorry, doesn't merely allow bad things into our life. I believe there are times when he brings bad things into our lives. Now, people really struggle with that when I say that, okay? So I started a long time ago. Second Chronicles 7.13. Not 7.14. Writing down all the verses that I have found where God is actually bringing bad things into our lives. We'll, we'll get to some of them in just a moment. <clears throat> we often hear televangelists and teachers of the Word say that they have the answer for things that are dealing with difficulties people that are dealing with difficulties in their lives. I believe their desire is to offer a hope by telling you that they have a solution. They have a hope, all right, but it is a false hope. They are trying to give you a formula to keep difficulties from you or to get rid of them when they are upon you. I'm afraid that they fit the example of giving us what our itching ears want to hear. It's no different than that. Now, now, now I know I'm going to bring up some things that are usually from other other people deal with, but hang in there with me because I'm bringing up these examples because they're the same kinds of things that we do in various circumstances, which we'll get to. Um, I believe that um, the reason they give us what our itching ears want to hear is because they misunderstand Scripture when it comes to God being a good God. You mentioned earlier that He is a good, good God. That's the name of this message. Even in spite of all that we're going to walk through, God is a good, good Father. Let's deal with the idea of God bringing difficulties into our life. In John chapter 15, verse 2, John chapter 15, verse 2, we know that the first half of it says, Listen, God deals with those that do not bear fruit by doing what? He takes them off. He casts them into the fire. Then he talks about pruning afterwards. And he talks about those that are bearing fruit. And you know what he says he does with them? He prunes the ones that are bearing fruit. So that they will bear more fruit. God is the one who does this. Have you ever gone through a time of pruning and it was like just super easy and no big deal? Not me, baby. God does the pruning. Out of meanness? No, not at all. 
Out of ugliness? No. He does the pruning out of love so that you will bear more fruit. Another passage in John chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus is asked, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? John 9, 2. Remember how Jesus responded? He said, Neither of them. This guy was born blind that my father might be glorified. Lest you wonder who brought the blindness. Remember the um, Psalms. Uh, David tells us in the, in the Psalms that, G, that God knitted him together in his mother's womb. Sometimes the blindness has nothing to do with the person that is blind. It is there because of what we're going to see and experience all around us. I hope you're beginning to see some application to this um, bus crash. I have to tell you, I'm glad that the difficulties come from God. Now, now, now let me back up. I, my brain isn't smart enough to figure out when does God bring them or when does God allow them. I don't know. But I know that he's sovereign. And so I can trust him in the midst of whatever comes about. And I'm glad that I can trust him because I can't trust Satan. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments, in a few minutes, about Satan bringing the difficulty. If Satan is the one who brings it, how can I trust him? But I can trust God. So lest you continue to struggle with the idea of God bringing difficulties into our lives, which is perfectly understandable if you do. Um, has God's character ever changed? No. Hebrews tells us he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Let me just give you a couple of verses real quickly. You can look them up later. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. God set before them, that he's talking to his chosen people, blessings and curses. Psalm 51, 8. David asks God for relief from the bones that he, God, has crushed. Proverbs 16, 4. God prepared everything for his purposes, even the wicked. Lamentations 3, 31 through 33. God caused suffering and brought affliction, even though he doesn't like to. Hosea 13, 8 and 9. God says that he will attack, devour, and destroy his chosen people. In Haggai, in three places, it says, God ruined the crops. There are tons of verses like this. Now, now, now hear me. I'm not saying this to talk about God being a mean God. Not at all. I'm talking about this so that we recognize his character. And like a good father, he does these things out of love. Now, if you had a good father, who took you behind the woodshed periodically out of love, you understand what I'm talking about. If you had a father who was mean and ugly, you don't understand this. You do here, but you don't understand this here. I get that. Hang in there with me, okay? I told you that I have these written down next to 2 Chronicles 7.13. There's a reason for that. We all know 2 Chronicles 7.14. But none of us have ever taken the time to read verse 13. I'll read it to you. It says, God is speaking, and he says, if I, meaning when I bring natural disasters. If I, meaning when I bring the things that impact your income. And this last part people don't like. If I, meaning when I bring diseases. Now again, I'm not smart enough to know when God brings them or when he allows them. But that he does bring them at times I have no doubt. And then this, this passage just kind of ta- caps the top of it. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 is where God talks about the fact that, look, a baby, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I say, I get it. I know. I see that clearly. His ways are higher than my ways and your ways. I have no idea. Why God does the things that he does. But I want to. I want to understand this better. As best I can. I need to see what else is written. On this subject. Before it begins to strengthen my faith. And I suspect that where where we're at right now. You'd be saying the same thing. 
Okay, Mark, you're making some arguments now, but strengthen my faith because you haven't done it yet. Uh, that's a legitimate statement for you to make. God is God, and I am not. I love Psalm 145.3, and I bring this out all the time while we're praying during our prayer conference calls. It says, God's greatness is unsearchable. You know what that means to me? Among other things. You and I are going to be in heaven for all of eternity. Which is one of the reasons why I love that song, 10,000 Reasons. We're going to be in heaven for all of eternity. And we're not going to know everything about God. We're going to continue to learn more about his greatness all throughout eternity. Now does that passage in Isaiah begin to make a little more sense? His ways are higher than our ways. His greatness is unsearchable. Let me keep moving. I don't want to get bogged down here. When can this be prevented? When can the accident that we are talking about have been prevented? If you want to go to the Cliff Note version, I have no idea if it could be prevented or not. Okay? I really don't. Surely, though, as we begin to think about it, there's got to be special prayers that fit certain circumstances and instances that I can pray so that I get what I want. Aren't there? What does his sovereignty mean anyway? And, and, and if I'm going to look at his sovereignty, what does it mean when it says God is, that Satan is the God of this world? Did, 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 did Satan throw a fastball by God and that's what happened to the bus? Did the guardian angel that was watching it, did he get sidetracked by a demon and, and, and this happened? Now, now, now these seem a little bit silly, okay? But let's think about this. What happened? 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 is a passage I always find a way to throw in, just accidentally. It says that this is a confidence we have in approaching him. That if we ask, listen, anything, so long as it's according to his will, we know that we have it. I wonder if those people that prayed for protection, I wonder what they thought about God's will. Mark eleven twenty four states a similar thing. It says, when you pray, pray believing that you have already received it. Now, just the fact that I'm spending this much time on this is going to make you worry. The next time you begin to pray for protection, you're going to wonder, do I have this thing that I'm praying for or not? Hang in there with me, okay? Um, I believe that the Bible makes clear to us this makes clear to us that we can confidently come before Him and expect Him to answer us the way we're praying it. That's that's I think the basis of Psalm five three. It says we come to the Lord in the morning, we lay these requests before Him, and then we wait in expectation. And the expectation isn't a, isn't a no or a maybe. The expectation is a yes. So, as I get into this, um, we need to talk about a couple things that, that, that I believe do not occur. I have a lot of friends that are scared to death of what they say. Be, like, scared to death. They wouldn't ever say that because it scares them to say that. Because they're afraid that whatever they put out there, out of their mouth, is going to come back to them. It's because of this inaccurate meaning of life and death are in the power of the tongue. Here's the problem. If life and death are in the power of the tongue, then this thing occurs here. I wrote, this is a little silly, but it, I'm keeping it simple to make the point. God is speaking. Gabriel, I want you to head down to earth and comfort little Johnny before the big final. Gabriel, I'm on my way. Johnny, walking into class. Oh, I just know that I'm going to flunk this test. God, Gabriel, stop. Don't go. Little Johnny just spoke death into his test results. I can't do anything about it. Now, that sounds a little bit silly, okay? But there are a lot of people that believe that way. And don't cast stones at them because you and I do the same thing under certain circumstances. And we'll continue to walk through this and see that. The reason I believe my friends think this way is because of an unrealistic understanding of what happened in the garden. 
They believe that in the garden, Satan gained mastery of this world and Adam and Eve gave it up. Which means Satan is now the God of this world. Well, the problem with that is in the Old Testament, after the garden, the things that God said about himself. He says in a bunch of places, I just wrote down three of them, Psalm 103, 19, his throne is above the heavens and he's sovereign over all. Psalm 115, 3 and Psalm 135, 6, they both say basically the same thing. I do whatever I want. Now, if this understanding of God, Satan be the God of the world is true, then this would occur. God, Gabriel, I want you to head down to earth and come for little Johnny before his big final. Gabriel, I'm on my way. Satan, claiming authority, I will cause little Johnny to flunk this test. God, Gabriel, stop. Don't go. The evil one has just claimed authority into Johnny's test results and I can't do anything about it. Now again, we, rec- we look at that as being silly, okay? But there are a lot of people believe- that believe that way. And I believe that you and I are part of them. You see, the issue is that we wonder how much we can really trust God. And so when you have a serious situation... Instead of asking God what his will is, you tell him what your will is. With regards to healing, with regards to little John's test, with regards to anything that we want to pray about. This is not just something silly that other people do. This is something serious that you and I do. We often don't want to ask God what his will is because we're scared to death of what he may say. His will may contradict our will. Now, lest you think that I'm just being flippant here or silly, I can tell you there is a church that told me I couldn't come back. You know why? Because they wanted me to teach them how to pray God's will until God's will contradicted their will. but I'm afraid that you and I do the same thing. You see, Satan didn't outfox God with regards to this tragedy. But it does make me wonder if we're willing to ask the Lord for his will rather than our will. So what should you pray? How will this impact your prayer life? Is prayer just blind luck, as I mentioned before? And are there any parameters that I can pray and still get what I want? The sobering thought is what I've already said. Your will may be in contradiction to God's will. And that's what we need to explore a little bit. Let's explore it this way. In Revelation, it talks about God opening a door that no one can shut. And I'm not going to talk about the theology about that. But people use that to say... Yes, God has opened up this door for me. I'm going to jump right in. May I just give you a caution? I believe that God often opens doors as a test to see if you're going to jump through it because it's what you want to do rather than waiting to see if it's what God wants you to do. And I feel sorry for these people that say, oh yeah, there's a door, there's cracked open, but I'm just going to tap on a little bit to push it open. That's foolish, baby. I believe that God often opens doors, not so we can jump through them, but to test us, to see if we're jumping through it because it's what we want rather than what he wants. You know, there's this passage in John chapter 15, verse 7. Um, So many of my friends love the second half of it. It says, then you will ask what you will and it will be given unto you. But you got to look at the first half of the verse. It says, when you abide in me, I will abide in you. Do do you realize why I can ask whatever I want and it will be given unto me? Because I'm abiding in him. And when I'm abiding in him, he then abides in me. The issue is that I'm asking what God wants me to ask. Not what I want to ask. I'm asking his will, not my will. When I'm asking his will, then I can say... I will ask what I want, and it will be given unto me. 
earlier I brought up 1 John 5, 14 and 15. But the confidence in asking something, no matter what it is, and having the confidence that I will get that. But it's based upon one thing. What? Praying his will. I'm afraid, folks, that we do not take the time to wrestle with God and wrestle with God and wrestle with God for his will. We just come into the throne room and we talk to God about this, we talk to God about that, we get up and we run right out. And God is saying, no, wrestle with me about what my will is. Now, I don't have time to get into praying for the sick. I may do that next week. But the idea behind this is coercing God. So let me tell you how we do this as Baptists. We pray for travel and mercy. Now forget about the bus crash for a moment, okay? Think about your own life. How many times have you prayed for traveling mercies? It's a rhetorical question, don't answer, okay? Do you see traveling mercies in Scripture? If so, where? I've looked. It ain't there. Okay, let me tell you what is there, though. Exodus 23, 20. I pray this all the time. Exodus 23, 20 says this. It says, the angel of the Lord is alongside you, and we know by... The context of this is God. The angel of the Lord is alongside you, guarding you along the way, so that you arrive at the place that he has prepared for you. Obviously, not every bus makes it to the airport. Obviously, not every car makes it to wherever it's going. Not every plane makes it all the way across the ocean. But what is that verse telling you? That verse is telling you that God was alongside you the entire way. And where that bus ended, where that car ends up, where that airplane ends up, God has prepared that place for you. Here's what that means. I don't have to get off the plane saying, I made it. I get off the plane saying, cool. Lord, what have you prepared for me here? Do you see the difference? Hey, here's why we struggle with this. If God is sovereign, it wasn't an accident to God. It wasn't a surprise to God what happened with the bus tragedy. If God is sovereign... If God is sovereign, I really can't trust him. We spend too much time giving God our will rather than seeking him for his will. He knows what you want. He knows what you need. Either he is sovereign or he is not. Can you trust God again? I believe so. God is so much bigger than what we imagine. A friend of mine likes to say, God's answers are always bigger than your prayer requests. I personally do not pray for protection for myself, okay? I never have. But that doesn't mean God and I don't talk about protection. You see, I talk to God about the fact that he has already said he is my protector. Now, today was different. I got to, I got to, I, I'm so close to here. Did you say earlier, thank God we don't live in downtown? My wife and I do live in downtown. We love living in downtown. When, the, when there was a hole in I-85, I loved that because of where we live, we didn't have a lot of traffic. It was really cool to get on and off the freeway. Anyway, anyway. Why did I go there? Paul talks about the fact that there are troubles without, there are fears within. It's not that if you're a holy person, those ain't going to come. They're going to come. The issue, and he brings that out in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. You know what the cool part about that is? Verse 6. Because he says, but God comforts the humble. There are times when you just don't know how to pray about something. And God wants you to come to him humbly. Say, Lord, I submit this to you. Whatever that means and whatever that looks like. Why do we do that? 
Because we can trust Him. He gives us His comfort so that we can comfort others in the self-same way. Every single time. Back in Daniel, you have the three guys who get thrown into the fiery furnace. I, I memorized their names when I was a kid. My shack, your shack, and a bungalow. That's how I remembered them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're thrown into the furnace, and they said something very interesting to the king. They said, yo, baby, my God, he can save us. And then they said this, but if he doesn't. Why could they say that? You think they were fearful when they said that? But he may not. No, not at all. They knew their God, and they knew they could trust him. My youngest son was a toddler and crawling along the floor at my grandma and grandpa Tutu's. So his great-grandma and great-grandpa Tutu. Now he's crawling, he's a toddler, and my grandparents had this floor furnace. See the brother. And it's like, you know, you know when, you go, when you take your kid to a basketball game and you say, do not cross the line, where do they go? To cross the line, right? Now the kid's just a toddler. I'm trying to tell him, no, don't do this. No, don't do this. You know what I finally had to do? I had to stand behind Brent walk with him until he put his little hand on that floor furnace. And then lift him up and, you know, get cold water on it. But he never went after it again. Now, some may argue, especially in today's society, what I did, I was mean with, okay? I get that. I feel sorry for y'all, and I'll pray for you guys. But the rest of you, you recognize, I didn't do that out of meanness to him. I did that out of love to him. I don't know what went on with that bus crash. And I don't think that there was anything diabolical about it at all. But I can tell you, there's a girl in heaven right now who would never want to come back to earth. She's in heaven. Her father said something very interesting. Her father said, um, where'd the quote go? Oh, I lost it. Oh, I remember it. He said, this is a perfect reminder that our life is fleeting and short. That our life here on earth is a wisp of smoke. I don't understand why difficulties happen all the time. Okay? But I know God. And I can trust Him in the midst of whatever difficulties come my way. And so can you. I know y'all. I know you know that up here. But I hope that through this message you know it here now. These are logical questions for you to ask when something difficult happens. And God's got big enough shoulders for us to deal with them. I'm going to close in prayer. If you're saved, this is an issue that you get. You understand if you're saved, then, okay, yeah, some, some of these are things I've needed to walk through. If you're unsaved, if you're unsaved, all of this is just entertainment to you this morning. You need to know that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, this is either entertainment or it's real. And I'm here to tell you it's real. I know because there are things that I deal with and when I take them to the Lord He gives me a peace that completely transcends my understanding. There are things that you have to deal with. There are difficulties in your life and I'm sure that you walk away from saying, oh man, where's the peace? If you are saved, God will bring you that peace. And He wants to. If you're not saved, the Word says today is the day of salvation. What a great day to finally be able to say, 
our Father, my Father. You see, you may use that. You may use that verb.